I'm delighted to introduce Noam Chomsky, widely regarded as one of the leading thinkers in human history. The Chomskyan revolution placed language study in a psychobiological setting and played a critical role in fueling the modern reemergence of the cognitive sciences. Chomsky's scientific rev revolution resurrected 17th century rationalist principles and then implemented them by analyzing human cognition in terms of a formally explicit computational representational theory of mind. The idea being to study the properties of human beings, including human cognitive capacities, as part of the biological physical world using the methods of normal science. Chomsky's latest incarnation of the generative enterprise, the minimalist program, further advanced linguistic theory as normal science by continued endorsement of Galilean experimental method and by articulating goals fundamental in the natural sciences, including the central goal of seeking explanation through theoretical simplicity and by possible unification with related fields. Chomsky's understanding of and commitments to normal science rationality, abstraction, and explanation continue to this day to pioneer human understanding of human nature. Of course, who we are has vitally important humanitarian implications regarding how humans should be treated with repercussions in philosophical, ethical, social, political, psychological, and economic arenas, fields to which Noam has also made profound contributions for well over a half a century while continuing to do so to this very day. Uh, the title of his talk tonight is What is Language and Why Does It Matter? Noam Chomsky. Well, the uh, title that was supposed to be announced, I don't know if it was, uh, added uh, a personal perspective, and yes, it's a personal perspective because uh, not only is there no consensus about what I'm going to talk about, but uh, actually it's a distinctly minority view in the whole range of fields that kind of converge around these topics. There is consensus on one matter. Uh, from the second half of the 20th century, there's been a huge explosion of uh, inquiry into language by any measure you take, scale, character, depth, uh, anything. Uh, far more penetrating work uh, is going on into uh, a vastly greater array of uh, theoretical issues, conceptual issues, and uh, just uh, typologically varied languages far beyond anything before uh, many new Topics have been open. Uh, the questions that students are working on today uh, could not even be formulated or even imagined uh, half a century ago, or for that matter, much more recently. And new problems and puzzles are coming into view actually more rapidly than old ones are being at least partially resolved. Now, these are all very positive signs of a lively, exciting array of interlinked disciplines. I've got my own reservations about them, which I'll allude as I continue. Uh, I think it's fair to trace this sharp and uh, unmistakable change in large part to new options that became available in the mid 20th century. Uh, options for considering more seriously the most fundamental question about language namely, what is it? Uh, by that time, advances in the formal sciences had enabled a clear formulation and understanding of what we ought to recognize to be the most basic property of language, I'll refer to it from now on as just the basic property, uh, namely that each language uh, provides an unbounded array of uh, hierarchically structured expressions that receive interpretations uh, both internally and externally. Externally through the sensory motor system, uh, internally at uh, some rather obscure system of thought that we know is there but don't know much about it. Conceptual, intentional uh, interface sometimes called for mental processing. Uh, that allows uh, uh, the ability to formulate this 
for the first time really allows a substantive formulation of a classical dictum, goes back at least to Aristotle, that language is sound with meaning. Uh, before that you could say it, but you didn't exactly know what it meant. Uh, especially if the word with was obscure, what does it mean to have sound with meaning? Uh, work of recent years, as I'm sure you all know, shows that sound is much too narrow, uh, but I'll keep to it for simplicity. Uh, and I think there's pretty good reason, I'll return to it, uh, to suggest that the classic formulation uh, is misleading in important ways and ought to be revised. Well, just given that much, uh, follows that each language incorporates a computational procedure which satisfies the basic property, the one I just mentioned. And therefore, by definition, a theory of each language is uh, what's called a generative grammar, and each language is what's been called an I language. Uh, I here stands for internal to an individual, internal, individual, and intentional. Intentional here with an S means you're interested in discovering the actual computational procedure, not some set of objects that it enumerates. Technically, that would be what it strongly generates. Uh, there, was another, there are other notions, like weak generative capacity and what some people, not me, call e-language. Uh, whatever that is, these are derivative notions. I have to apologize for that term. It's actually my term, but it's not used the way I would have ever used, and I don't understand how it's used, frankly. It seems to be used to mean something like corpus or something like that, but that's not a coherent notion. Uh, I don't know if weak generative capacity in the e-language or whatever it is are even definable for natural language. These are questions that were discussed quite a lot about in the 1950s, so a lot seems to have been forgotten, judging by the literature. Well, uh, correspondingly, every uh, approach to language, no matter what it is, sociolinguistic, uh, whatever, uh, should recognize at least the one perfectly obvious fact. Uh, each language is a property of an individual. It's internal to that individual, mostly to the mind, the brain. That's what's sometimes now called the biolinguistic framework, but it really should be a truism. Uh, and. Uh, whatever, this core concept uh, must be understood to be a prerequisite to any further inquiries. There are plenty of further inquiries. They go into all kinds of topics, uh, acquisition, use, uh, origin of languages, language in society, the internal mechanisms that implement the systems. That means both the system of knowledge, competence, and, and the various uses, the performance to distinct but related tasks. Well, evidently, investigation of these further topics uh, relies on guidelines, maybe they're at least tacit, but they have to be there somewhere, which are provided by the answer to the question of what language is. Now, that shouldn't be considered controversial. So, for example, no biologist would uh, dream of proposing an account for the development or the evolution of the eye without telling you first something pretty definite about what an eye is. And the same truism, and of course it's truism, should hold of inquiries into language. Regrettably, it doesn't, but it should. Uh, in earlier years, before this shift became possible, the basic property did resist clear formulation. In fact, that was also even true in mathematics. Even the notion of proof, basic notion, wasn't really closely understood until a little over a century ago, uh, and linguistics even more so. So you take some of the classical literature, so for example, the Saussure's centenary is coming up right now. And for him, uh, language, in the relevant sense of language, is a storehouse of words and images uh, in the brains of a collectivity of individuals founded on what he called a sort of contract for Bloomfield, language, I'm quoting, is an array of habits to respond to situations with conventional speech sounds and to respond to these sounds with actions. Uh, he gives another different definition in his postulates for the science of language, 1920s. 
Uh, here, language is the totality of utterances made in a speech community. That's something like William Dwight Whitney's traditional conception of language as the sum of words and phrases by which any man expresses his thought. That's what he called audible thinking. That's a slightly different conception in ways to which I'll return. Uh, Edward Sapir uh, defines language as a purely human and non-distinctive method of communication, communicating ideas, emotions, and desires by means of a system of voluntarily produced symbols. Those are the classics. There's others from less famous figures which are similar. And uh, with such conceptions, it's uh, perfectly natural to follow what uh, Martin Jose called the Boasian tradition, referring to Franz Boas, uh, holding that languages can differ arbitrarily and that every new language should be studied without any preconceptions. Obviously, it can't be literally true, but something like that seemed natural. So accordingly, linguistic theory can consist of nothing more than a collection of modes of analysis, procedures of uh, analytic procedures uh, to reduce a corpus to some organized form, basically procedures of segmentation and classification worked out in considerable detail, both in European and American structural linguistics. Well, the shift of perspective to generative grammar within the biolinguistic framework uh, opened the way to much more far-reaching inquiry into language and language-related topics, and it also greatly enriched the variety of evidence uh, that bears on the study of each individual language. So it's not just a matter of organizing the data of that language, but if you're studying, say, Japanese, uh, you can study uh, acquisition, uh, neuroscience, uh, dissociations of linguistic and other cognitive capacities, uh, much else. And you can also, uh, if you're studying Japanese, uh, learn from what's discovered in the study of uh, you know, Walbury or any other language. Uh, that's all on the basis of a a pretty obvious and quite well-confirmed assumption that the capacity for language relies on shared biological properties. As far as we know, virtually totally shared, no known group differences. Now that's the topic of uh, UG, universal grammar, contemporary adaptation of a traditional phrase, doesn't mean what it meant traditionally. Well, in earlier years, it was understandable that the question, what is language, it received only such indefinite answers as the ones I've just alluded to, ignoring completely the basic property. It's, however, I think kind of surprising to find that uh, similar answers remain current in contemporary cognitive science. Uh, not untypical is a study in a current journal, Frontiers of Psychology, study of evolution of language, it characterizes language only, this is by two well-known people, I'll skip the names, uh, characterizes language as the full suite of abilities to map sound to meaning, that's language. That's basically a reiteration of Aristotle's dictum, it's much too empty to ground any further inquiry. Again, no biologist would study evolution of the visual system assuming no more about the phenotype than that it provides, paraphrase, the full suite of, suite of abilities to map stimuli to percepts. Couldn't get off the ground that way, or in this case. Uh, well, there are also uh, broader reasons to be concerned with the question, what is language? There's a fairly clear indication of these and some interesting comments by one of the leading scientists who studies human evolution, a recent book by Ian Tattersall, uh, it's a review of currently available scientific evidence. Uh, he observes that it was once believed that the evolutionary record would yield early harbingers of our later selves. The reality, however, is otherwise, for it's becoming increasingly clear that the acquisition of the uniquely modern human sensibility was instead an abrupt and recent event. He actually dates it in the very narrow window of about 50 to 100,000 years ago. And uh, goes on to say that the expression of this new sensibility was almost certainly 
crucially abetted by the invention of what is perhaps the single most remarkable thing about our modern selves, namely language. Uh, therefore, an answer to the question, what is language, uh, matters very greatly to anyone concerned with understanding our modern selves, homo sapiens. Uh, the founders of modern biology, of course, they lacked the evidence of current science that Tattersall's reviewing, uh, but they adopted kind of a similar view. So Darwin, for example, wrote that man differs from animals solely in his almost infinitely larger power of associating the most diversified sounds and ideas. That's an infinite version of Aristotle's dictum. Uh, of course, the phrase, uh, uh, almost infinite, that's a traditional phrase, uh, but we should interpret it as meaning infinite because there's no sense to almost infinite. Uh, you can't, uh, and it also similarly makes no sense, I'm sorry if this offends lovers of big data, but it makes no sense to contemplate huge, finite, non-extendable lists that's close to meaningless. Uh, something else that should be kept in mind, unfortunately. Well, even earlier than Darwin at the origins of modern science, uh, Galileo uh, was entranced by what he called a marvelous invention that provides the means to construct from 25 or 30 sounds the infinity of expressions that enable us to reveal everything we think and all the movements of our soul, all of our mental acts, we would say. Uh, that's uh, audible thought in Whitney's phrase, uh, but Galileo went beyond by recognizing the unbounded character of each language. It's unusual, though it's an obvious point. In fact, if you look over the whole history of 2,500 years of history of inquiry into language, it's extremely hard. I've been able to find four or five cases where anyone actually pointed this out explicitly. Maybe they knew it. Uh, well, the same recognition as Galileo's uh, and a much deeper concern for the creative character of language use, of normal use of language, uh, that pretty soon became a core element of Cartesian science, what we call philosophy. Uh, there's no reason today to doubt the fundamental insight of Descartes that use of language has a creative character. It's uh, unbounded, typically innovative, no limits. Uh, the, it's, it's appropriate to situations, but uh, not caused by them. That's quite a crucial distinction. And it can engender thoughts in others that they could have, they recognized, they could have expressed themselves without limits. Uh, it's a critical insight, crucial for the history of philosophy, but for modern should be for modern cognitive science and linguistics today. Uh, we should also bear in mind that a, an aphorism of Humboldt's that's often quoted these days, namely that language, he said that language involves infinite use of finite means. Uh, he's talking about use. Uh, there's been a lot of progress in understanding the finite means that, are, that make possible infinite use, but the latter notion infinite and uh, appropriate use that remains uh, as much a mystery as it's ever been, though there has been some progress in understanding conventions that guide appropriate use. Well, a century ago, uh, Otto Jespersen raised the question of how the elements of language, and quoting him, come into existence in the mind of a speaker on the basis of finite experience yielding a notion of structure that's definite enough to guide him in framing sentences of his own. Uh, crucially, he said, free expressions, typically new to speaker and hearer. So again, he's alluding to the infinite, unbounded character of language. So the task of the linguist then is uh, to discover those mechanisms, how they arise in the mind, go beyond that to unearth what Jesperson called the great principles underlying the grammars of all languages, that's UG in our terms. And by unearthing these great principles to gain a deeper insight into the innermost nature of human language and of human thought. Now those are ideas that sound 
much less strange today than they did uh, during the structuralist behavioral science era that came to dominate much of the field, this marginalized uh, Jesperson's insights. Well, reformulating Jesperson's program today, uh, the basic task is to investigate the true nature of the interfaces and the generative procedures that relate them to determine how they arise in the mind, how they're used, if we can ever get that far, uh, the primary focus of concern, of course, being free expressions. Well, as soon as the earliest attempts were made to construct explicit generative grammars, roughly 60 years ago, immediately many very puzzling phenomena were discovered. Uh, they'd never really been noticed as long as the basic property was not clearly formulated and addressed. And there was syntax, of course, but it was considered just use of words uh, determined by convention and analogy, which gets you nowhere. Uh, actually, this is, you go back 60 years ago, it's kind of reminiscent of the very earliest days of modern science, around 1600. For millennia, scientists had been, the greatest scientists had been satisfied with simple explanations for f familiar phenomena. So for example, rocks fall and steam rises because they're seeking their natural place. Uh, objects interact because of what were called sympathies and antipathies. Uh, we perceive a triangle because its shape floats through the air, literally, and implants itself in our brain, and so on. Those were the received answers in the sciences. As soon as Galileo and others allowed themselves to be puzzled about these facts, modern science began. And it was quickly discovered that our beliefs are all senseless and our intuitions are mostly wrong. Uh, the willingness to be Puzzled is a very valuable trait to cultivate. Uh, it's, uh, it's from early education to advanced inquiry. Now, unfortunately, that's much too little recognized in the human sciences. In the physical sciences, by now, it's routine. Uh, but it wasn't not very long ago. Well, one puzzle that came to light about 60 years ago and remains alive and I think highly significant uh, has to do with a very simple but curious fact. So consider the sentence, uh, eagles that fly swim. Simple enough so I don't have to write it on the non-existent blackboard over there. Uh, and then put a word in front of it, say the word instinctively. Instinctively, eagles that fly swim. Or the word can. Can eagles that fly swim? Well, there's a, a evident fact about that. Uh, the uh, words instinctively and can, uh, they link to a verb, but they link to swim, not to fly. Uh, so the thought, take the sentence, can eagles fly swim, there's a thought that it can't express with can being associated with fly, and that's pretty difficult to formulate. It's a fine thought, but try to formulate it even with circumlocution. Pretty hard, that impedes communication, one of many such cases, but it's somehow part of the design of language. Well, what's puzzling about this is that the association of the clause initial element, instinctively or can, to the verb is remote and based on structural properties, not proximal and based on linear properties. Linear procedures are far easier to compute. So language makes use of a property of minimal structural distance. It never uses the much simpler operation of minimal linear distance. Uh, that's sometimes called structure dependence of rules. And the puzzle is why it should be so. Not just for English, but for every language. Not for these constructions, but for every construction. And even where data for the child's learning the language is ludicrously small or in the case of instinctively non-existent totally. Never any errors, uh, uh, no, no alternatives, this is just reflexive. So why? Well, there is a very simple explanation for it. 
namely the child, take the child, reflexively knows the right answer in these cases and all the cases because even though the evidence is slim or non-existent, and the reason is that linear order is simply not available to the language learner who's confronted with such examples. The language learner is guided by a principle of UG, one of those great general principles that Jesperson was alluding to, though he didn't think of this one, uh, a principle of UG that restricts search to structural distance, minimal structural distance. That's a plausible explanation, and as far as I know, it's unique. I don't have any other proposed explanation. I mean, there's proposals, but they quickly shot down. Uh, uh, it's uh, somehow resistant. I, it's, the explanation is resisted, in fact dismissed, which I think is a sign of the immaturity of the field. I think it's kind of like the sciences in the 14th century or something. You have a fine explanation, but for ideological reasons, you can't, can't accept it. Uh, the, the general principle of minimal distance is uh, used all over the place in language design. It's presumably one instance of a much more general principle that enters into design and acquisition of language and uh, elsewhere too, just call it minimal computation. Computation tries to be as as uh, efficient as possible. Uh, and the evidence shows strikingly that uh, human language invariably makes use of minimal structural distance rather than linear distance uh, in every relevant case. There's no known exception. Uh, despite the far greater simplicity of linear distance, which is a puzzle, but I think the answer is what I stated. Uh, there is some supporting evidence, in this case, from the neurosciences. Uh, there's a research group in Milan, uh, uh, Andrea Moro, who many of you know is the linguist involved. Uh, they studied uh, brain activity of subjects who were presented with uh, two types of stimuli. These are all invented languages. Uh, some of the invented languages satisfied UG, uh, minimal structural distance and other UG principles. Uh, others uh, were designed so as to violate UG principles. So for example, a, a rule of negation that places the negative element after the third word, say linear distance, but much very simple computation, much simpler than the ones in natural language. Well, what they found is that in the case of conformity to UG, there's normal activation in the, uh, in the standard language areas, but when linear order is used, uh, it's just diffuse activation over the large parts of the brain. Uh, in that task, case, the task is apparently being treated, it can be solved, but treated as a non-linguistic puzzle. Uh, there's uh, analogous work by Neil Smith and uh, Ianti Maria, simply his colleague, who work, as many of you know, with a cognitively impaired but uh, linguistically fluent <laughs> subject, and uh, similar experiments reach the same conclusion. Actually, there's a small industry in computational cognitive science trying to show that these properties of language can be learned by statistical analysis of massive data. Large number of papers on this. Uh, every attempt that's clear enough to investigate has been shown to fail uh, irremediably. Can't, can't do anything with them. Which is, but it really doesn't matter because the efforts are beside the point in the first place. Suppose they were to succeed, which happens to be a virtual impossibility, but suppose they were, that would leave entirely untouched the only question. Namely, why does language invariably use the complex computational property of minimal structural distance, and why does it never employ the far simpler option of minimal linear distance? Actually, that's a that question somehow can't be seen. That's, I think, a good illustration of the unwillingness to be puzzled that I mentioned earlier. It's the first step in serious scientific inquiry. It was recognized in the hard sciences since Galileo. And until it penetrates the cognitive sciences, they're never going to get off the ground. I think that's pretty evident. Uh, 
Well, a broader thesis still is that linear order is never available for computation. Uh, not just this kind of case, but never, at least in the parts of language that involve syntax and semantics, so-called semantics, the core part. Uh, so why do you have linear order? Well, there's an obvious reason for it. Uh, the sensory motor system requires it. Uh, you can't talk in parallel, so you talk linearly. Uh, uh, but uh, so that requires somehow that whatever's going on in the mind be sent through a pass, uh, some kind of a filter that makes it come out with linear order. Uh, that's the sensory motor system, which is not specifically adapted to language, but are the parts that are essential for externalization of language and perception. Uh, they appear to have been in place uh, hundreds of thousands of years before language emerged. In fact, uh, chimpanzees have apparently pretty close to the same auditory system that humans do. They even pick out pretty much the same phonological features, but it's just noise as far as they're concerned. Uh, well, the matter isn't settled, but uh, uh, there's uh, very considerable evidence that this broader thesis uh, may in fact be correct. And so if so, the basic property is not the way I formulated it before, uh, and the way it's formulated in the technical literature, my papers too. Rather, the basic property should be the uh, generation of an unbounded array of hierarchically structured expressions that map to the conceptual intentional interface to the mental system, system of thought. And the rest is kind of ancillary, tacked on. Well, if that's correct, and it seems to be, there's a good reason to return to a traditional conception of language as an instrument of thought. It's to revise Aristotle's dictum accordingly. Language is not sound with meaning, but meaning occasionally with sound. Uh, more generally, some form of externalization, uh, typically sound, though by now it's pretty clear that it's modality independent. And in fact, externalization is rarely used if you think about it, by far, overwhelmingly, the most use of language is never externalized. It's what's sometimes called internal dialogue. There's very limited research into that, though it could be studied. I think the reasons there's limited research is, again, kind of ideological, not intellectual. It's an interesting topic. Uh, but it, if, so most of the research is basically introspection. Yours is as good as anyone else's. At least my introspection, you can think about it yourself, is that what reaches consciousness in internal dialogue, you know, just walking along thinking or something, what reaches consciousness is just fragments, tiny fragments. Uh, and then as soon as the fragments come, a fully formed expression can be formed in your mind. It usually isn't, but you can do it. Complicated, fully formed expression, and it's instant. It's far too quick for articulators to be involved, or probably even instructions to articulators. And it's often not produced, even internally, so it's all going on somewhere inaccessible to consciousness. Now, that's an interesting topic, and it could be studied, it could be explored, uh, and think of ways of doing it, but basically hasn't been little, but not much. Well, issues like that aside, investigation of the design of language which is the starting point for any further inquiry, gives pretty good reasons to take seriously the intuitions of Galileo and others that language is essentially an instrument of thought. An externalization then would be just an ancillary process tacked on now and then. And I th there's plenty of further investigation that supports that conclusion, I won't go through it. But if it's established, and at least to me it looks pretty sound, it follows that particular uses of, ex of language that depend on externalization are even more peripheral aspects of language. Uh, one of them is communication. That's actually contrary to a virtual dogma in all the related fields that has no support that I know of, but that's just pervasive. Uh, language is commonly described as somehow in essence a means of communication. It seems to be anything but that. Uh, it would also follow that much of the extensive speculation about uh, language origins, about evolution of language, is just on the wrong track to begin with. 
It's treating it almost always as something about speculations about the evolution of communication. It's a totally different topic. Well, the matter, this matter hasn't been studied either, though it could be, but I suspect that the modern doctrine that holds that communication is somehow the essential form of language, function of language, it probably derives from uh, the powerful influence of associationist and behaviorist assumptions. They retain a very strong grip, even when people who publicly reject them. Uh, and along with that, there are, you can easily find highly oversimplified and quite untenable interpretations of modern evolutionary biology. It's an interesting topic, but I'll put it aside. Well, let's return to the basic property. Now we reformulate it. The computational system of I language yields an unbounded array of hierarchically structured expressions mapping to the mental system, the conceptual intentional interface. There are ancillary processes that may or may not externalize them in some sensory modality. Uh, naturally, we seek the simplest theory of the basic property, uh, the theory with the fewest uh, arbitrary stipulations. Uh, any such stipulation, apart being, from being unwanted, just on normal methodological grounds, is also a barrier to some eventual account of origin of language. And I stress eventual because we're not even close. Uh, well, uh, this is standard scientific method. We ask uh, how much can we, uh, how far will that carry us? Uh, the simplest, there's a simple, the simplest of all computational operations. It's embedded in some manner in every relevant computational procedure is an operation that takes objects, call them X and Y, that have already been constructed and uh, forms a new object, call it Z. Uh, that's, uh, uh, that's the operation that's now sometimes called merge. And the question is, what is it? What's the operation that does this? Well, the principle of minimal computation entails that neither X nor Y should be modified in this, uh, this, in this process, that's minimal computation, and that they should be unordered. Ordering would add further complication, and as I just mentioned, that's a conclusion that's quite strongly supported on other grounds. Well, what that means is that merge is just set formation. So merge of X and Y just gives you the set containing X and Y. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that the brain contains sets. Uh, the only reason I mention that is that there are misinterpretations in the current literature which dwell on this topic, fulminate about it, in fact. Uh, what it means is that uh, fundamental, uh, whatever is going on in the brain, uh, which we don't know, has properties that can be characterized in these terms. Uh, this is, again, commonplace in the sciences, like uh, chemists uh, don't expect to find the Kekulé diagram for benzene in a test tube. You know, they're not confused about that. Only linguists are confused about such things. Uh, suppose uh, X and Y are merged and neither is part of the other. Uh, so as in combining, say, read and that book to form the syntactic object, whatever it is that corresponds to read that book. That's called external merge. And suppose that one is part of the other. So say Y is part of X. So you combine, say, which book, and John read which book, and you form which book, John read which book. That surfaces as which book did John read by further operations all come back to them. Now, that's an example of a ubiquitous phenomenon in natural language, displacement. Phrases are heard in one place, but they're understood both in that place and somewhere else. So the sentence, which book did John read, is understood something like, for which book X John read the book X. Now, in this case, the result of merge is again the set XY. Uh, but now there are two copies of Y. One is the original one remaining inside y, uh, X. The other is the copy that's merged with X. Okay, that operation is called internal merge. Uh, notice, incidentally, contrary to 
some confusions about this, that there is no operation of copy formation and no operation of remerge. They don't exist. It's just plain merge, simplest possible way, set formation. Uh, internal merge and external merge are the only possible cases of binary merge. So if we assume that merge is a binary operation, these are the two options. There's nothing else. And, and notice that both of them come free. It would take an arbitrary stipulation to bar either one of them. And that's a pretty important fact. Its important has, importance has only been gradually sinking in for some years since it was noticed in the late 90s by Kisa Kitahara first, which I just discovered. Uh, for many years, it was assumed, uh, by me in particular, that displacement is a kind of an imperfection of language, some strange thing that has to be explained away by some more complex devices and assumptions of UG. But that turns out to be incorrect. Displacement is what you expect on the simplest assumptions. It would be a problem if it didn't appear. That would be an imperfection. It can, in fact, be plausibly argued that internal merge is actually simpler than external merge. If you think it through, it requires much less memory. Uh, but essentially, they're both there, free. And it's a problem if a language doesn't have either one of them. Uh, there's another important fact about uh, internal merge in its simplest form, that is, satisfying the principle of minimal computation. Uh, it yields the structures that are appropriate for semantic interpretation in a quite a broad variety of cases. It's illustrated in the simple case of which book did John read? As I said, it really means which book for which book X, John didn't read the book X, which is what you get from internal merge. However, of course, that's the wrong structure for sensory motor system. The sensory motor system drops the copy universally in language. Only the structurally most prominent copy is pronounced. The lower copy is deleted. Actually, there's a revealing class of exceptions, which in fact support the general thesis, but I'll put that to the side. Uh, why do you have deletion of copies? Well, that follows from another application of the same overriding principle of minimal computation, namely, essentially, pronounce as little as possible. You've got to pronounce one of them. There's no evidence that the operation took place, but do as little as possible. Uh, it, there's a result. The result is that the articulated sentences have gaps, and the hearer has to figure out where the missing element is. Well, it's well known in the study of perception and parsing that that yields quite difficult problems of interpretation. In fact, these are some of the most standard parsing problems, filler gap problems, they're called. So in this quite broad class of cases, language design favors minimal computation and it disregards complication in the use of language, right? So it says language design to be computationally perfect but no good for communication. Well, that fits the other things that I said. Uh, notice that any linguistic theory that replaces internal merge by other mechanisms has a double burden of proof to bear. First, it has to explain why, it why does it have the stipulation barring internal merge, and second, it has to give a justification for whatever new mechanisms are yielded or in designed to yield the displacement phenomena. In fact, displacement with copies, notice, because that's generally the right forms for semantic interpretation. Well, uh, this holds, interestingly, for much more complex cases, but I'll skip them. That would require a blackboard. Uh, but just as the, uh, but, but they're quite an interesting class of complex cases that work exactly like this. Uh, but, and just as in the simpler cases, like say instinctively eagles that fly swim, it's absolutely inconceivable that any form of data processing yields these outcomes. Relevant data simply are not available to the language learner. And the results, therefore, must derive from what David Hume called the original hand of nature, our terms genetic endowment, specifically uh, UG, universal grammar. And in ways like these, we can derive quite far-reaching and firm conclusions 
about the nature of Hugh G. Uh, a side comment on the literature and linguistics, philosophy, psychology. Uh, very common claims in current literature, technical literature, that there are no genuine linguistic universals, and no UG. Uh, the reference is not to UG, it's just a confusion. The reference is to descriptive generalizations. So for example, Joseph Greenberg's famous uh, uh, universals, which are quite interesting, but they're generalizations. And generalizations are quite likely to have exceptions. That's the nature of generalizations. So for example, the generalization I mentioned about the leading copies, it has some exceptions, quite interesting ones, which strengthen the principle behind it. And uh, that's all over the sciences. Uh, in the standard sciences, that's understood. So for example, 19th century, there were, take a famous case, there was discovery of perturbations in the orbit of Uranus. Uh, if that had been linguistics, not astronomy, it would have led to the conclusion, okay, let's throw out physics. Because there's a generalization and the, uh, there's a problem about the perturbations that shouldn't be there. Well, since this is science and not linguistics, it, uh, uh, scientists went on to try to figure out why. And sooner or later they found Neptune and you know, explained the perturbations. And exceptions to largely valid generalizations played a similar role uh, all over the place in the sciences and repeatedly in the study of language too. But there is a strange, curious, pre-scientific belief that if you find exceptions to generally valid generalizations, it means you've got to throw out everything. You can find plenty of that in the literature. Well, putting those, I think, perversions aside, uh, you can conclude, I think, that if language is optimally designed, it's going to provide structures that are appropriate for semantic interpretation, but that yield difficulties for perception, hence for communication. And there are many other kinds of examples that illustrate uh, the same conclusion, uh, structural ambiguities, for example, or garden path sentences. Uh, particularly interesting cases, islands, they're not too well understood, but partially understood. So it takes a, uh, we're called ECP constructions. Uh, so take the sentence, uh, they asked if the mechanics fixed the cars. Uh, you can ask how many cars, uh, and you can ask how many mechanics. Uh, the sentences are, uh, how many cars did the mechanics fix? Uh, how many mechanics, uh, if, uh, how many mechanics, let's say, how many cars did they ask if the mechanics fixed? How many cars did they ask, how many mechanics did they ask if fixed the cars? They're different, strikingly different. That's an ECP violation. Uh, the, uh, the one that you can't say is a fine thought, but you have to express it through some kind of circumlocution. Again, that impedes communication. All islands are like that. Plenty of similar cases. They're partially understood. It's a big task to study them completely, but insofar as they're understood, uh, these structures follow from the simplest free application of the simplest rules, yields difficulties for perception. And quite generally, to repeat, where there are conflicts between communicative efficiency and computational efficiency, in every known case, communicative efficiency is simply disregarded, sacrificed. And that lends further support to the revision of the common sense Aristotelian dictum and support for the view of, uh, for re rejection of that and support for the alternative traditional view of language as an instrument of thought with uh, communication and other uses being side properties, ancillary properties. Actually that conclusion fits pretty well with the very limited evidence we have about the emergence of language. As Tattersall pointed out, it's apparently quite sudden and very recent in the evolutionary time scale. And it's a fair guess just looking at that. And we know quite confidently that there's been no change, no evolutionary change, no detectable change ever since humans began to scatter around the earth. That's 50, 60,000 years ago, a few left Africa and quickly were all over the place. 
there's no detectable change since then. So what you seem to have is no detectable change in maybe 50, 60, 70,000 years, and nothing around maybe 20 or 30,000 years before that. You can change the numbers a little if you like, but it doesn't matter much. That's a very narrow window in evolutionary time. And a pretty fair guess, and that's about all we know about evolution of language, I should say. Huge literature based on absolutely nothing. Uh, these are the only things that are known. The rest is fantasy. Uh, it's an interesting kind of pathology in the field. Well, I think a fair guess is that some slight re rewiring of the brain in an individual, of course, yielded merge, unbounded merge, that provided the basis for unbounded and creative thought, sometimes called the great leap forward, which archeologists find in the archeological record, and the very remarkable differences that separate humans from their predecessors and from the rest of the animal kingdom, as far as we know. It is, just as the Cartesians recognized, an extremely sharp divide nothing mystical about it, that's things like that happen in biology, it's now known. Well, these remarks, I'll stop here, only scratch the surface. Uh, what I hope they can do is to illustrate why the answer to the question, what is language, it matters quite a lot. And uh, close attention to this fundamental question can yield conclusions that have many ramifications for the study of what kind of creatures humans are. Thanks. Okay, so we have uh, about 30 minutes for question and answer. And there's microphones, two microphones. One there and one there. So if you want to step up and ask a question, please feel free to do so. Hi. Uh, I'd like to ask about uh, how do you see, how would you like to see the surrounding fields uh, interact with linguistics? Given that uh, linguistics, formal linguistics has become quite technical, a lot of philosophy looks very exotic to a lot of linguists. A lot of people are content to work on their own very specific technical work. How would you like to see philosophy, psychology, other cognitive sciences link in with linguistics? Well, all of these are philosophical issues. In fact, they go back centuries. Descartes is called a philosopher. Hume is called a philosopher. Locke was a philosopher. They dealt with these problems in interesting ways. And modern philosophy may not deal with them, but if so, that's a comment about modern philosophy, not about philosophy. Now, there are obviously psychological questions. As far as I can see, linguistics just is part of psychology. So can't ask what the relation is. It's like asking, how does perception relate to psychology? Uh, so I, I don't see a question. These are psychological problems by definition. And throughout the whole history of philosophy until pretty modern times, these have been core philosophical problems. They still are, to some extent, but not the way they were in the, throughout the tradition. I think the tradition is worth saving in this case. Hi. Uh, first, uh, thank you very much for uh, your talk this evening. And uh, my question is about the third factor principles you proposed uh, in recent papers. And uh, in those papers, you hold that the third factor principles include uh, principles of efficient computa computational efficiency and uh, principles of uh, natural law. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on uh, organism-independent principles of natural law that are likely to So what uh, principles condition of natural the, law would apply to language? Yeah. Well, I mentioned one, which I suspect is a general principle of international, of <laughs> Wrong topic, some other talk. <laughs> That's why I have two sides of the brain. Uh, so the principle of minimal computation, it probably is all over the least organic world, maybe the entire world, with different kinds of application. And I assume there are others. Uh, after all, we're, you know, this is the uh, language is just 
you know, it's, it's kind of like an organ of the body. It's a subsystem of the organism which is, uh, develops uh, out of you know, the normal ways uh, and is subject to whatever laws uh, hold of organisms. Not, not too much is known, even in general biology, about this. You know, general biology is pretty much a descriptive field. It's just, it's not a field that has a lot of theory or laws because it's too complicated, but uh, principles like this probably do apply. Maybe others. You know, if you can find some, that's great. Yeah. Thank you. I should say that even simple ones like this carry you pretty far. You can go quite far with just pursuing the few things that we sort of partially understand. I tried to give some indication of it. I think it goes far enough to show that an awful lot of what goes on in the field is just seriously misguided. Hi, uh, I have a two-part question. So um, the first question is, uh, if I understood your talk correctly this evening, um, the idea is that the, the computation system is meant to feed the CI interface, and then sometimes this comes out as an utterance, but not always. So this might be a thought, for example, one that doesn't map to the sensory motor interface. Is that correct? Could you get it? Yeah. 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 So if there's a mapping, if it's just a generation of something at CI, uh, maybe it's a mapping from narrow syntax to CI, maybe it's some other thing, but it ends up at that interface, yeah, then it's a thought. Okay, so then does that mean that um, this uh, might- In fact, an interesting case is whether this exhausts thoughts. I mean, it has been supposed that that exhausts thoughts. So if you read, say, von Humboldt again, uh, he argues, you know, suggests that that is the totality of thoughts, the things that could, in principle, be, be expressed in language. That's an interesting question. Okay, so then uh, part two would be then, um, so if we're trying to account for ungrammatical, un ungrammatical sentences that, that speakers utter, would we have to then say that the source of ungrammaticality would have to be at the SM interface where something has gone wrong, maybe the wrong copy has been deleted or something like this, and this is where we would then find the locus of ungrammaticality? What does this have to say about ungrammaticality? Yeah, so... Well, we, we, you know, first of all, ungrammaticality is kind of a funny notion. The, uh, whatever's in your head assigns some kind of interpretation, even to word salad. Okay, that, that means that that's generated. Uh, we can call it ungrammatical if we like, but that's a kind of a theory internal notion. Uh, among the various kinds of expressions, they have many different dimensions. Uh, some loosely are called more or less grammatical, others are called more or less appropriate, or other many dimensions. But it's, uh, you know, there isn't a split between grammatical and ungrammatical. That's incidentally one of the reasons, for those of you who know the technical literature, why the work on re weak generative capacity is mostly meaningless, uh, because it assumes a sharp break between what's grammatical and what's ungrammatical, and it's simply not the way natural language works. In fact, what are called ungrammatical expressions are used all the time, perfectly naturally, perfectly appropriately. In fact, every metaphor is an ungrammatical expression. If you say, say, misery loves company or something, it's an ungrammatical expression, but it's certainly meaningful. Uh, literature uses ungrammatical expressions all the time, purposely, because they're evocative. They force the hearer to construct uh, you know, something in their own minds to kind of fill out what's missing. So they're perfectly meaningful. They're part of language. They're determined just as much as everything else is. Uh, so uh, again, this, if you go back to work in the 50s, uh, this was discussed a fair amount. I mean, no real answers, but it was discussed and should be discussed. Okay, well, I guess I, I meant more and more of a technical sense of like a derivation crashing, for example, that maybe we would, we, would, we would think that this might happen at the SM interface, since we wouldn't tend to think we would have word salad thoughts, for example, although I guess we could, couldn't we? Can you have word salad thought? Well, I, try I, it. I guess I can. I mean, <laughs> I mean try reading, the, say, Finnegan's Wake or E.E. E. Cummings. I mean, it's pretty close. To, it's not, of course, it's not word salad. It's contrived and constructed. But the first time you read it, it's word salad. 
you think about it some more, and something comes through, maybe. But it certainly means something. And in fact, uh, even with less you know, exotic examples, literature just uses it normally. And so does normal speech often. Not word salad, but things that are designed to violate principles and have their own interpretations. You take a look sometime at uh, a book like, uh, books of literary theory like William Empson's uh, Seven Types of Ambiguity. Uh, this is about 50 years ago. Uh, what he points out is that that's the essence of poetry, is to try to put things so narrowly and so economically that the reader is forced to contrive a world of interpretation. That's perfectly decent use of language. And uh, a normal speech is like that too. It's often highly elliptical, for example. The hearer is supposed to just fill things in. So. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chomsky. It's an honor to have you here. In, as a student of linguistics, which I am, I love linguistics, I enjoy studying it very much, and I think, I believe strongly that scientific inquiry is one of the best things that we humans do. I also have no good answers for the, my, for the question I'm about to ask, which is, given all of the misery in our world, all of the social, economic, and other problems, how do we justify pursuing something so comparatively esoteric. I, I, th I think I, I'll tell you a story about a linguistic, <laughs> a linguistic institute. I think maybe the first time I went to a summer institute of linguistics was probably the early 60s, maybe 1962, 63. It was in the Indiana. Uh, I had just come back from civil rights demonstrations in the South. One of Jackson, Mississippi, I don't know how much of you know about this stuff, but they were pretty violent. I mean, the state police just went berserk. You know, they were beating everyone bloody. People were fleeing to the steps of the federal courthouse and the marshals who were sent from Washington to protect the demonstrators were throwing the demonstrators back into the crowd so the state police could smash them to pieces. Uh, in the evenings, people would gather in black churches and try to get their courage back up to go out the next day. And this went on for day after day. Anyway, I was there for a while. I, I came back and went to the Linguistic Institute at, uh, at Indiana. And I just happened to run into a kid there who had come from the same demonstration we'd, been, we'd met down there. And we were walking across campus together, not saying much. And he suddenly turned to me and he said, how can they be so interested in phonemes? <laughs> It's a good question. It's stuck with me ever since. I think that's your question. I, don't I think you can be. I mean, I think you can both be concerned with the problems of the world and with problems of uh, intellectual importance, which tell us, in this case, tell us something about something not directly related to problems of the world, but about as close as you can come in the sciences. What's the nature of human beings? I don't think that's an answer to your question. It's the kind of question you have to answer for yourself. <laughs> Thank you. I was afraid of that. <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much for being here this evening. Um, so, it's fairly clear that linguistic derivations rely on some notion of economy. and. Uh, one of the culminations of economy constraints uh, is phase-based derivation. And uh, a common critique to that type of thinking is that the capacity for human memory has been largely underestimated. What would your reply to be to, to a critique like that? Well, um and we know, if, if, we have to, if you're talking about human memory, first of all, we have to distinguish between short-term memory and long-term memory, okay? So short-term memory is pretty limited. Uh, it's uh, pretty much like other animals. It's, uh, there's research, like for example, uh, 
Well, there's a lot of interest these days, there shouldn't be, but there is in embedded sentences, sentences with embedding. It's mostly misunderstood, but uh, this, it was worked on 50 years ago, and it was found that uh, in normal speech, you almost never have embedding, very limited embedding. It's just too, too much computation, so you can't do it. That doesn't mean you, it's not there. I mean, it's kind of like, uh, uh, say, arithmetic. If you look at people's use of arithmetic in their heads, it's extremely limited. If numbers get big, you can't add them. Uh, that doesn't mean you don't know arithmetic. You know arithmetic, you just have to have external memory. It's kind of like a computer, it's the same. And the same is true of embedding. So if you listen to speech, you're not going to find much. It's mostly paratactic, more or less, because too much memory. Now that's short-term memory. Now what about long-term memory? Well, that's pretty large. Uh, like uh, a normal person may know, say, 50,000 words, but it doesn't do you any good. Uh, George Miller, who worked on memory a lot during the, you know, back in the old days, he once just did a calculation of how many, you know, pretty much grammatical sentences there were of the length of the uh, uh, Reader's Digest. Reader's Digest is eighth grade reading level. Okay, so how many grammatical sentences would you have of uh, eighth grade reading level? It was greater than the number of particles in the universe. I mean, you can't even talk about memory. It's nowhere in the right dimension. So yeah, you can memorize a lot of words and uh, you can recognize a lot of people more or less. They're very specialized kinds of memory. But in this domain, it does nothing for you. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful lecture. Actually, um, throughout uh, your lecture, I feel that you somehow completely dismissed uh, the research program that is based on characterizing the language, language based on um, some usage based or some mainly communication efficiency. And I find it quite unfair because um, it, I think nobody uh, nowadays denies that there is some genetic basis for language. And even if we accept the hypothesis that language is uh, optimized for computation rather than communication, not all um, the grammars that are allowed by UG, for example, are actually implemented. So there could be some limitation or some constraint that could be imposed by the uh, necessity of the communication. So I would like to have your thoughts uh, on this. Yeah, I understand. So I've dismissed communication and usage-based studies. Yes. If you want to carry them out, it's okay. <laughs> I mean, I don't dismiss them. I think it's extremely unlikely that anything will be learned from them. Uh, just as if, uh, say, physicists started, say, taking uh, videotapes of things happening outside my office window, you know, leaves flying around and stuff like that. Uh, they could get a lot of data. In fact, they could get a pretty good prediction of what's going to happen next. In fact, they do way better than the physics department does. <laughs> but try to get a thesis for that. Well, in the sciences, you can't because they're not interested in something in some kind of rough generalization that you can pick up by looking at a lot of data. They're interested in understanding things, okay? So even if that non-existent videotape experiment could get a better prediction than the physics department could, which it certainly would, uh, nobody would care. And I don't understand why it should be any different in the case of language. I mean, if anything can be discovered from uh, a data analysis, fine, let's see it. It doesn't look very likely. It hasn't happened in other fields. Uh, but if so, okay. Uh, as far as communication is concerned, you know, it's an activity. Uh, language, is one, language is sometimes used for communication. Uh, it's only one of the many means of communication. I mean, everything we do is a means of communication. Uh, how you comb your hair, you know, uh, what clothes you wear. Uh, um, just about everything you do is some kind of presentation of yourself, it's saying something. And language is one of the ways of communicating. It's not the main thing in language, but it's part of it. And you can study communication. In fact, uh, 
You can study evolution of communication. So for example, Mark Hauser has a, a book called Evolution of Communication. Uh, he actually has a chapter on language at the beginning and a chapter on language at the end, but that's kind of to sell the book. It's uh, really about uh, you know bats and echolocation and stuff like that. And uh, every organism from bacteria on up has means of communication. Humans do too, lots of them. So you can study, you can't find out anything much because evolution's a hard topic, but uh, you can at least look at, uh, the, I think there's a reason why people like to look at it. In the case of evolution of communication, you can kind of imagine some kind of continuity from bacteria to humans. And that makes, if you kind of like this idea of, uh, uh, you know, evolution taking place in tiny pieces, it doesn't happen that way. But if you like that idea, it can make you feel good. Uh, but that's because every, every organism has communication systems. But only one organism has language. And uh, like Tattersall said, if you're interested in language, it just doesn't tell you anything. Except, yeah, sure, like everything else, this is one of the means of communication. I mean, I'm kind of exaggerating. There are some things you can get. So, for example, there's interesting work on, say, a technical question on what are called neo gricean conventions. It's quite interesting work on that. You know, what are the proper conventions for discourse? And there is quite interesting work that goes on on that. Now, that's not what people are studying when they do massive data analysis and try to find something out about communication, but it bears on communication. Thank you. Starting many years ago, and often on your authority, or with an appeal to your authority, I was told that competence, not performance, was the key problem of linguistics. Now listening to your talk today, I hear uh, you putting far more emphasis on performance. I wonder if you could clarify. Well, I didn't, uh, performance and confidence? Yes. I, if I did, I wasn't aware of it. I didn't intend to. <laughs> I mean, th this, is all about, this is all about competence. I mean, there is, of course, you know, we use, uh, th 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 this is considered to be a controversial distinction. I haven't the slightest idea why. It's a very simple conceptual distinction. There's a distinction between what you know and what you do, okay? Nothing controversial about that. Like you know arithmetic. We could study what is it that you know, you know? Maybe what you know in your head somewhere is a pan or axioms or something like that, who knows? Uh, we can study what you do with arithmetic. Like what happens if you're given, you know, you're given a, you're asked to multiply two big numbers. How do you do it? We could ask about that. Uh, the second question is not a very interesting one. It, um, because too many factors enter into it, like say short-term memory, too many things to separate out. An interesting question is what's your knowledge of arithmetic? And we could ask the same question about any other uh, cognitive system. In the case of language, that's competence and performance. Uh, everything I've talked about today, at least as I understand it, is basically about what you know about competence. How's language design? There are other questions about how you use the language. And as I just mentioned here, uh, what you use is a very small part of what you know. Okay, like for example, take say embedded sentences. Uh, you can embed sentences indefinitely. If you have enough memory, time, space, and so on, you go on indefinitely, easy to show that. So it's infinite. But what you use is very narrow, because you just have too little memory. I heard, I heard you referring a great deal during your talk today about what at least I interpreted as performance. But I may have, been, I may have misinterpreted. Well, uh, <laughs> I, I didn't think I was, but okay. <laughs> Maybe I was. Yeah. Well, my question, I'm afraid that my question might sound a little bit too elementary, but I'd like to see why, well, the minimalist framework assumed that a sentence is constructed from bottom to top, right, uh, through the cyclic merge. But at the same time, we pronounce and understand the sentence from top to bottom because the minimalist framework assumed that 
all human language show more or less a right branching nature, right? So I'd like to see why human language shows such a mirror pattern. You know, how, uh, it's not, I mean, how we process is very much uh, uh, debated. For example, there are analysis through synthesis models that argue that you process top down. Uh, we, we, of course, process linearly, because that's the way we hear it. You're stuck with that. You're, just as you're forced to produce through the articulatory apparatus, whatever's going on in your head. Like, for example, it, it appears, I was trying to argue, I think, that you just don't have linear order in the competent system. But of course, you perform linearly. You have to, and you perceive linearly. So uh, how you use the system is uh, determined by a lot of cognitive systems that we have, uh, memory, the structure of the auditory system, the sensory motor system, that these, uh, the uh, use of the internal knowledge has got to be processed through those things just as a use of arithmetic is. And if there are, and there are incompatibilities, you're correct. In fact, I tried to emphasize one of the most striking ones. Uh, one of the most striking cases of incompatibility that I know is the sharp conflict between computational efficiency and communicative efficiency. Language is just badly designed for communication but well designed it to be efficient, it seems. I mean, that's a, there's a kind of a, a phrase that's sometimes used for this that drives people crazy. Uh, language is beautiful but unusable. It's uh, kind of true, you know, even if people don't like it. it just, and there's a reason for it, I think, probably the reason that I mentioned. It has to do with the way it evolved and the kind of creature we are. It's a system that, developed in a way which uh, satisfies apparently pretty narrow constraints on what a well-designed system can be, uh, but happens to be used by people who have problems with this because we have some sensory motor system, memory system, which doesn't work for it. So you struggle through. And if there are incompatibilities like top down and bottom up, that's another one. Thank you. Whatever you say. I think we're going to wrap it up. Thank everybody for coming. Thanks a lot. And thank you very much for coming out here. Thank you. process thoughts in your head that allow you to see what's happening in the book. And I was wondering, everyone has a different perspective of the characters or the scene. Everyone has a slightly different perspective of it. And I was wondering why. <laughs> You and a lot of other people would like to know. <laughs> That's an interesting question. And there's some, there, like in most of the sciences, there are little pieces of it you can study. Uh, one interesting case, maybe some of you know something about this, is uh, autism. Uh, it turns out that with autistic children, commonly, uh, they may be, actually, I have no cases where an autistic kid will be mesmerized by children's cartoons, you know, watch them over and over again, same cartoon, and not understand anything, literally not understand, because the kid can't understand why the characters are acting the way they are. 
Like, why is this character running away? I'm not afraid. You know, why is that character afraid? The ability to, it's called theory of mind. You know, nobody knows what that means. But the ability to <laughs> gain the perspective of someone else, which in normal children you know, it is around three or four. It's when kids start showing signs of theory of mind, so-called. Uh, but uh, autistic children often don't have it. They can, that's why they, some uh, people who are autistic sometimes seem uh, to be oblivious to the way you think, to feel. You know, they don't know when you want to talk to them or when you don't want to talk to them. They can't uh, uh, interpret your experiences as being different from theirs. And you see it in things like what you're describing, like inability to uh, watch a cartoon or read a book. Or, because when we do it, normal people do it, you're, you're just imposing a lot of rich knowledge and structure on the little bits and pieces that you're seeing. The bits and pieces that you're seeing are kind of hints. You know, what you read is a kind of a hint. And you add a kind of a rich uh, interpretation and array of knowledge to it. That's why you can read the same book over and over again and understand it, get more, uh, get a richer experience each time or a movie or anything else. And the extreme example is uh, what I quoted from uh, Empson on poetry. Uh, the idea is to make you impose quite a lot. So it's an interesting question. And it's, you know, it's, it's a bit only barely understood. Bits and pieces are researched. But you'll find out about it when you... <laughs>